Before we open up our Bibles to the book of Acts uh, 24, where we're going to be today, I just, uh, if you weren't here last week and you didn't hear the message from last week, I'd really encourage you to go online to listen to that, to watch that. Um, it was a message that, um, thank you, um, but I came off of an extended time of just prayer and fasting um, leading into that, and I really feel it's an important message for us as a church, um, for us as followers of Jesus, of being reminded about the spiritual world and spiritual reality that we live as a part of. And uh, so if you didn't get a chance, I uh, really encourage you to check that out and to, to watch that or to, to listen to that. Uh, have you ever heard of the saying, good things take time? Anybody, anybody heard that? Yeah. So, you know, you think about that. You know, my wife made this awesome, you know, pumpkin soup uh, last uh, night, you know, fresh from like, you know, the pumpkins, you know, she baked them and did all of this thing. And then Noah, my son, got in the middle of it and he's a chef guy. And so he's t testing all these things. It was really fantastic. It was really very good. Good things take time. You think about a baby coming. You know, good things take time. You know, there's a lot of expectation that, that comes. Now, the pessimist um, side, uh, other side of that, there's another phrase to, that goes with this. Good things take time, but bad things take a really long time. Have you ever heard that phrase? No, because I just made it up, right? You know, so I just came up with that. So, and, and it does seem like when we're in the midst of bad things, it seems like it's forever. It, things, it seems like it's, it's lasting and going on for a really long time. Particularly we're in the place where we need to wait. Where we're in the waiting place. It's like, man, come on, let's move on. Let's get moved. It seems like it lasts forever. And I have to be honest with you. I have to be really honest with you. I am not good at waiting. I do not like to be, I do not like waiting. I, you know, if I can just, uh, if I can just be moving in some direction, that's better than just not doing anything at, at all. And um, does anybody else have that experience? You know, does anybody, you know, like relate to that? And I know, I know you do because uh, my, my wife, she's going to uh, be a part of this party up uh, in Apple Hill this afternoon. And so she got a text about how to avoid Apple Hill traffic, right? I mean, because we're like, okay, it's that season. We want your money. We don't want your cars, right? But um, and it's like, stay off of 50. How do I get around all these people who are blessing us in our community during this, this month of October? And it's because we don't want to be waiting. We want to be sitting there and not moving. It's like, how do I get around the waiting? Uh, this uh, Thursday, um, Todd and my friend Todd and I are headed to, to Kenya. Uh, I'm going to be going to Nairobi and, and working with some leaders there and connecting them into peer mentoring and coaching networks and speaking to some pastors and ministry leaders on burnout and encouraging them. And the, the, the challenge about getting from here to Nairobi, Kenya, is, is that there's nothing fast about it at all, Right. So we're leaving 10.15 at night, you know, catching the red eye and then sitting, you know, in the airport, JFK, for six hours until our next flight and then on a plane for 14 to 16 hours to get there. On the way back, the last time we were stuck in JFK airport, I think it felt like about 20 hours. I think it was mostly like eight hours, 10 hours because there was just not a flight. And I'm on my phone. It's like, there's got to be a flight getting out of here. But my assistant, Teresa, she did an awesome job and she found the earliest one and I'm like, just sitting there waiting. I'm not good at waiting. Have you ever noticed that God's not in a hurry? Have you ever noticed that life, that things take time? And that we can oftentimes battle against that. We can struggle against that. We've been in this journey through the book of Acts, and we're coming to the end of it here but as we come to the end of, of um, the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 24, it's sort of this journey that began in Acts chapter 21, where Paul, he gets to the city of Jerusalem, he goes into the temple, uh, the, the Judaizers, the, the ones who are stirring things up, believe that Paul has brought a Gentile into the, into the courts of the, the temple, which is totally against the, the rules, the religious rules, cultural rules, and causes a riot that breaks out. And Paul is, is attacked and he is uh, beat up and, and, the, and he has to be rescued by the Roman soldiers. And sort of just a little bit of a context that, that this religious fervor and this cultural fervor was something that was a part of the culture that was going on there because the city of Jerusalem was an occupied city. The, the nation of Israel was an occupied nation by the Roman authorities and, and powers. 
and the, and the Jewish people hated it. They, they hated and they had their sacred places and they had their cultural boundaries, which are totally different than Roman culture and society. And when the Romans would, would violate those, it would cause extreme violence. Uh, Josephus tells a story about a Roman soldier who exposed himself in the temple area and that um, in the riot that took place because of this one Roman soldier of what he did, 20,000 people were trampled to death in the riot. I mean, that's, that's a riot. And then another soldier, he uh, burned one of the Jewish law scrolls and the, the crowds demanded that he be executed and the Roman authorities they capitulated to these demands. A decade later, uh, their war would produce massacres. Over 20,000 Jews were slaughtered in Caesarea in an hour that would culminate in the, in the uh, temple's destruction because of Gentiles being, you know, this, this battle and this cultural and religious conflict that was going on. So Paul was in the midst of that, and we see that in about chapter 21 where he's where the story begins to unfold where Paul is in the Jewish temple and a riot breaks out and then he makes the sermon that he, he's been rescued by the Roman soldier. He says, I want to talk to the crowd. And so he talks to the crowd and he speaks into their Jewishness and into their life. But then he ends with this phrase, and I was sent to the Gentiles to bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And another riot breaks out. And then he gets pulled before the, the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling authorities within the Jewish um, cultural and religious realm. And it was made up of Sadducees and Pharisees, these two different theological groups. And he throws a bomb in the middle of them about, um, figuratively, about the resurrection, of which they totally disagreed on. And they got into a riot with each other. I mean, there's just all of this conflict, all of this battle that's going on. And Paul was such a figure to stir up conflict that there was a group of uh, men who made a vow that they would not eat nor drink until they had assassinated Paul. And so they created this plan in order to lure Paul out into a place where they could get to him to kill him. And Paul's nephew hears about this, tells Paul, Paul sends the nephew to the Roman authorities to tell them of what's going on. And it ends up that the Roman authority, the, the military authority there in Jerusalem gathers a group of uh, 470 soldiers to escort Paul from Jerusalem to Caesarea, 60 miles away in the middle of the night in order to protect him. Four, it takes 470 soldiers to keep yourself safe. That would mean there's a little bit of conflict going on. There's a little bit of danger that's happening. And so as we come to chapter 24, in the midst of all of this chaos that's going on, still God is in the details. God is in the details. God is at work in all of these situations, in all of these things that we see happening to Paul that, that seems to be out of control and in chaos. And here we are in the end of chapter 24 where Paul is being brought to Caesarea because Caesarea is the center of religious um, or the center of political and military power for the Romans over this area of the world. And that's where Paul has to answer to the religious or to the um, political authorities of Rome, to Felix. And let me read to you in verses 20, uh, chapter 24, verses 22 through 27. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gives, gave orders to the centurion that he should keep, be kept in custody, Paul should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. And after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control in the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. In verse 26, at the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul, so he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So Paul, after all of this chaos, there's this, all of a sudden, Paul finds himself stuck in the in-between. 
Have you ever found that in your life, being sort of stuck in the in-between? It's like maybe there was chaos. Maybe there's all kinds of things going on all over the place, and all of a sudden it just goes quiet. And you're like, not there, not there. Where am I? I'm in the in-between. He's stuck in the city of Caesarea that he's been falsely accused by the Jewish leaders and authorities, and they have a really long memory. They're not forgetting it at all. They kept pressing the case. And then he's also stuck in the middle of a political impasse where the political leader, he's not going to make a decision because he doesn't want to offend the Jewish people, and he sort of wants to have other things going on, and he's not willing to step up and to have courage and to do what's right and to do what's just. And so Paul is stuck in the middle of this whole thing. And as, and as I was reading this passage, and I was thinking about this, I was thinking about our lives. And, and this is the thing I, I want us to sort of wrestle with today is where are you stuck in the middle? Where are you in the place where God has you in the waiting? Where is the story of God as we see it being worked out in these lives here and 2,000 years ago in an ancient culture and an ancient land? Where is God's story touching your story today? What is it that you need to hear from God as God is not in a hurry in what's going on in your life, as you are in the waiting. And one of the things, as we see this story that I just read, is uh, in Paul in this in-between place, is the evidence of God's grace meeting Paul in the midst of the waiting. And in, that, in your life, that that when you're in the waiting, one of the things that you need to be looking for, one of the things that you need to be knowing and aware of is, is that the grace of God is waiting to meet you in your waiting for God who is not in a hurry in your, in your situation, in your life. Again, in verses 22 and 23, Felix having a rather accurate knowledge of the way. The way is the, what the, the Christian movement was called, the way of Jesus was called at that point. He put them off, saying, when Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. Lysias is the, um, the Roman commander who kept rescuing Paul from. And there's no indication that actually Lysias ever got called and, and showed up in the situation. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but having, have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. And in this situation, so Paul clearly is uh, not his own man. He doesn't have freedom. He is put into captivity. And there's all kinds of places that you could be put into captivity if you were going to be thrown into prison or, or jail within the Roman world. And there was a lot of really bad places that you could end up. And some of those Paul had ended up in, in his life. But this wasn't one of them. In fact, what Paul seems to be put under here is something, something similar to house arrest. That he's there within the same compound that the, the ruler that, that Felix is, is, is a part of. So you know it can't be too bad because he's not going to be suffering in his living situation. And that he gives orders that um, Paul's friends can come and his compatriots and his um, fellow workers of the gospel can come and to meet his needs. And so Paul has access to those people who are going to care for him, who are going to pray for him, who are going to feed him, who are going to clothe him, who are going to watch over him, that can come and go. It's a, it's a pretty good situation. There's an underlying motive we saw there that, that Felix actually wants some money out of the deal. But essentially Paul becomes this sort of this on-call philosopher, religious discussion person for Felix whenever he feels like it. And when we're in the midst of the waiting, when we're in the midst of the, the, the place where God isn't in a hurry and we are, the thing that we have to do is we have to slow down enough, we have to open up our eyes enough to see that the care of God will show up in small and unexpected ways. That his grace is going to meet us wherever we are. 
Because God's grace is greater than your situation. God's grace is greater than your anxiety in your waiting. God's grace is more powerful than the struggle that you find yourself in and trusting God in whatever it is that you're facing in your life right now. The care of God is going to show up in small and unexpected ways. And so we need to look for those God moments. We need to to look for and see those God sightings. When we gather together as a ministry team every other Tuesday morning, one of the, as we talk about ministry, the, the place that we always start is in this area of where have we seen the impact of God? Where have we seen a God sighting? Where is God at move in your life or in somebody's life that you've heard about um, at Cold Springs Church? Because it's important for us not to just keep doing things, but to stop and to recognize that God is on the move, that God is touching lives, that God is working in people's lives, and that's what the business we're in, is, is, is revealing God in our lives and helping each other to see the presence and the love of God as he draws us deeper into a love relationship with him and with each other. And we want to recognize that, those things. And so his, these God sightings of tender love Almost always, let me tell you, they come in the form of a person because that's the way God shows up in our lives. It's through somebody else. And so where are you seeing God bring a person into your life? Where is an unexpected blessing that God has sort of shoved under your door and all of a sudden there it is, the envelope that says, I haven't forgotten you. I love you. That, that small thing, that little thing. But also I find that God's grace shows up in a thought that comes into our mind or a memory that we have of, 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 of something good, of God's goodness or his faithfulness, of his grace that we experience at another time to remind us of the character of God. I also want to remind us that in that all of everybody sitting around you, almost guaranteed, is in some place of waiting. And the person that God wants to use to encourage them may be you. And I've talked about this before, is, is that anytime God brings a person to your mind, that is the Holy Spirit's invitation for you to, at the very minimum, pray for them but to go beyond that and to reach out to them in some way and to let them know that you prayed for them and that you care about them, that God brought them to you, your mind. It's a huge encouragement. You know, one of the, the people that do that in my life is actually here this morning, Steve Barr. He's one of um, the pastors in the community, and we've served in this community almost parallel. And I'll get these texts on Sunday morning from Steve Barr. He's like, hey, man, praying for you. Preach Jesus. Thank you, Steve. That's awesome. Who do you do that to? Who does that to you? Who are the names that come to your mind, the encouragements that God wants you to, you know, we're so con- connected now, disconnected to connected, right, you know, with our phones, but you can send a text off in just seconds. And you know what? Here, it, the smartphone, there's actually a word in there that we don't use very often called phone right? You can actually call somebody and talk to them. It's amazing. It's actually a function on your phone to call them, speak. Who is God calling you to be the evidence of his grace in their life? There's somebody. It's that name that comes to your mind. It's the tender care of God being expressed through you. As Paul is in the in-between, one of the things that is so cool about seeing the story of Paul is is that Paul doesn't forget why he is where he is. I, a lot of times, forget why I'm where I am because I'm so busy thinking about where I want to be, which is not here. It's somewhere else. And Paul doesn't forget why he is where he is. 
And here's the thing, is, is that Paul knows that his life is about telling other people about the, the goodness of Jesus and the power of Jesus and the love of Jesus and the repentance that happens when we come to Jesus and the new life that comes through that faith in Jesus. Verses 24 and 25, after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. You are where you are for a purpose. You know that? You are where you are for a purpose. And that purpose is to declare the goodness and the glory of God, the love of Jesus and the faithfulness of Jesus in your life and in your story. You see, that's what Paul does that. And, you know, the the, the sooner that we sort of recognize and understand that that's what our purpose is, the better it is for us. See, but here's the challenge, is that to tell other people and to declare the goodness and the glory of God in our situation means that we have to look more at Jesus than we look at ourselves. See, because it's really hard to tell other people about Jesus when all we see is ourselves and our cha- challenges and our pain and our difficulty. But when we begin to look to Jesus, we begin to see his grace We see his love, and we can begin to tell other people about his grace and his love, even in the hardest and most difficult and challenging of things. I'm not saying it's easy. In fact, it's extraordinarily difficult. But it is the place that God is inviting you into to see more of who he is. Now, Paul did this in this situation. He was he was under house arrest, right? You know, he's, he's essentially in prison. And he can't decide where he's going to go, what he's going to do, but he is called to Felix upon Felix's desire to talk about things. And when he gets a chance to talk to Felix and his wife, Drusilla, he, he talks to them, and it says what he talked about was righteousness, self-control, and coming judgment. So that was Paul's approach to evangelism. And you're going, well, that's sort of a strange thing to talk about. Righteousness, self-control, judgment. What's, what's up with that? There's got to be a story behind that story. There is a story behind that story. Do you want to hear the story behind that story? Sure you do. Okay, good. Because um, I'm going to tell you, all right? And it revolves around his wife, Drusilla, and who Felix is. Felix was an extraordinarily corrupt leader. That Felix was all about his agenda and what he could get out of his position. And he had powerful relatives that protected his unscrupulous behavior. So that was the character of Felix, who Paul was talking to. Drusilla, his wife, who's about 20 years old at this point, Drusilla was actually married to another person and divorced her other husband when she was 16 years old because Felix wanted Drusilla as his wife. And so she divorced her husband at 16, which you think about, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a sort of interesting start to the whole marriage journey, isn't it? And she was married to this sort of minor Syrian leader, divorced him so that uh, she could marry Felix. And so Felix is in the political power. She's Jewish. Felix is not Jewish. There's all kinds of things going on here. So Paul, he's talking about righteousness. He's talking about self-control. He's talking about judgment. Do you think that that might relate, might have touched a nerve uh, with Felix? Because do you see what his response is? Felix was alarmed and said, go away. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. Paul spoke into Felix's story and Drusilla's story. The hope of the gospel, which challenged the presence of their life. In our lives, as we declare the goodness and the glory of God, what God wants you to do in your waiting when God is not in a hurry is to declare his goodness and his glory and to remember that who you're talking to is a person. You're talking to a person who has a story. And they have a story that's common 
and they have a story that's unique. And the love of Jesus can meet them in their story. And you know, um, Timothy Keller, a pastor in New York City, he was talking about sort of these everyday overflow behaviors that we need to have as just everyday followers of Jesus. How do we share our life in Jesus with the people around us? And he was saying, you know, number of, one of the things we need to do is, is that we just need to let other people that we go to church, that, we, that we're engaged in a faith journey, that we're engaged in a faith community. And when we have that opportunity to bring that up, that we do. And that we can just stop there. We just, we begin, you know, that's a part of, of our faith life and, and sharing that in the world. And, but then, you know, as people talk about their challenges and their issues where they're experiencing God not in a hurry, where they're in the in-between time, where we share a little bit of our story of that we're a follower of Jesus and that God has made a difference in our life in that situation. We don't even need to go any further with that, but we acknowledge that Jesus is a part of our story. And then when the door opens up a little bit more is, is that we just begin to share a little bit of our story. Of where has God been real? Where have you seen the extraordinary, ordinary graces of Jesus in your waiting, in your life? Paul was, Paul was in the waiting. He was in the in-between. And yet he didn't forget the goodness and the faithfulness of God. How about you and where you are right now? What, what are you wrestling with? What are you struggling with as you are in the waiting? I want to I wanna invite you. We're, we're gonna, I'm gonna, there's going to be a, um, a song that's going to play. The, the lyrics are going to be up here on the screen. And, and you can close your eyes. You can look, look at the lyrics, read the lyrics as you're doing this. But what I want you to do is I want you to, to listen for the voice of God of what... He wants to encourage you in as you are engaged in your waiting upon him.
Did you hear something that you needed to hear this morning? Of the faithfulness and the goodness of God? That he is there in your waiting? When God is not in a hurry, which he never is, by the way, how do we live? What, what do we need to remember in the midst of that? Verses 26 and 27 in Acts 24. At the same time, Felix hoped that money would be given him by Paul, so he sent for him often to converse with him when two years had elapsed. Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Two years elapsed. Have you ever been in that place? It's like, hey, God, whoa, over here. Right, yeah, uh, excuse me. Over here, pray, do, pray louder. Stop talking so much. You know, I don't know. What, what's, what's going on? What, how, yeah, where are you? What's, what is happening? The thing you need to remember is this, is that you're not forgotten. You are not forgotten in the waiting. And, and when we're in the midst of this waiting, I mean, we, you know, one of the places I encourage you is always to turn to the scriptures. The scriptures can be such an encouragement. And one of the things I love about the Bible is the Bible is an authentic, real story. It's a real book. Real people of, of their stories, of them in the waiting and how they experience that. Become a student of the Psalms. You know, one of the things I love about the Psalms, the Psalms, you know, there's this like exaltation, like God's greatest, this is fantastic, we're victorious. And then there's another Psalm that says, man, life stinks, I can't believe how hard things are. You know, where is God? I can't hear a word from him. Go to Psalm 42. If you're in that place of waiting and, and you think that God has forgotten you, go to Psalm 42, you'll find a soulmate. Know this, that God can be trusted. God can be trusted in your waiting. You see, our, our choice is this, is that are we going to trust him? Are we going to put our trust in God? It, and the reality is this, is that God is the only perfectly trustworthy one in our lives. Your, your spouse, your children, your parents, your friends, your co-workers, at some point, they're not going to meet your expectations. They're not, they're going to let you down. They may even purposefully hurt you. They're going to break trust. God will never do that. God is completely and perfectly trustworthy. But in that also remember this, you probably won't understand, that there is a mystery in what you are experiencing. There is a mystery in the waiting. There is a mystery in the, in the challenges that you are experiencing or the person that you love is, is going through that you're walking with and going, God, where are you? What's going on? The, the whys, the, the hows, the whos, the whats, those questions that sort of resonate with us. It reminds me of the prophet Isaiah 55, verse 8, the prophet Isaiah capturing these words of God. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And there's this promise here in the midst of the mystery of God where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. My ways are now, there's a disconnect. There's a mystery there that we live in and we will never get out of. And, and, and you and I are a lot alike. We want God in our box because then we can control God. Then we can understand God. 
but God will not fit in your box. And he will not stay in your box. There is a mystery. But there is a mystery connected with his goodness and his faithfulness. And this is where faith is built. So you have to see faith as a spiritual muscle in our lives. And the only way that we grow stronger physically, the only way we grow stronger spiritually is if we exercise the spiritual muscles in our life, and that is of faith. We were having, at our uh, life group, uh, we are having this conversation, and, and uh, it came up that, you know, somebody said that, you know, I know that God never gives us any more than we can handle. I says, hold on, stop, wait a second, I got to challenge you in this. This is because that's, that's, this, this, this Christian saying that is absolutely, completely, 100% false. And, and as it goes around and we say it, see, because here's, here's the thing, is if God never gave you anything that you couldn't handle, then you wouldn't need God in your life for anything. And God, the reality is, is that God constantly gives us things that are greater than us because it's an invitation for us to trust God. So the lie is God never gives us more than we can handle. The truth is, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's faith. That is trusting God in the moment. And if you allow it, God will redeem the time. See, part of the story that I think sometimes we forget to tell when we talk about Jesus is this, is the, the part of the story that is so powerful and so promising, and it is this, is that Jesus is restoring all things. So you go to the beginning of the book, and you go to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and there, there's a story of creation, and, and you know God creates, and it's good. God creates, it's good. God creates, it's good. It's good, it's good, it's good. He gets to, to man and woman, and he says, and it is very good. But then they mess up, and there's brokenness, and it's not good. It's, it's this mess that's created by Adam and Eve and their choices and the decisions they make that turn history and humanity into a path of brokenness. But you go to the end of the book in Revelation, and what God is doing is he's restoring, and he promises he will restore fully and completely that which is good, is good, is good, is good, is very good. And I'll be honest with you, my brothers and sisters, you have to understand this, that God is restoring and we will experience restoring as we follow Jesus, but there is not complete and ultimate restoring that you will experience until the other side of eternity. Some of the pains and some of the sorrows, some of the, the, the difficulties and the challenges that you're going to face, there are going to be scars that you're going to carry with you. But there is a day, there is a promise that God will redeem and he will restore in Joel 2, verse 25, it says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. God sent his judgment on his people in order because their hearts had turned away from him to turn their hearts back to him. And when they did, he says, I will restore. And that's the promise that God is going to do in you, in your life. When God is not in a hurry, take courage. And here's, here's, here's one last thing about that. Taking courage is not an individual sport. Taking courage is to encourage and to be encouraged, which requires the community of us around one another in love. Be courage, be encouraging, encourage and be encouraged as we walk together because God's not in a hurry but he's always faithful let's pray Jesus thank you that there is courage in the waiting that you are doing your work in us and through us even though we don't understand or get it all the time but you are trustworthy help us to trust you help us to see you Help us to love you and to love 
each other. In the name of Jesus, I pray.